Let's officially call this meeting to order. This is the February 10th special Board of Education meeting to take the place of the originally scheduled Monday night meeting. It was rescheduled due to weather. Jan, would you like to call the roll, please? Mr. Newsom? Here. Mr. Riley? Here. Mrs. Truth? Present. Mrs. Zimmershe? We have three members, board members present, so therefore we have a quorum, so the meeting is official. Presentation and recognition. The first award will go to the certified employee of the month, Bad Barger, pre-K teacher at Washington Pre-K Center. Uh, Curtis is going to do that. Yep. Okay, there are not many people who teach for over 30 years, retire, and come back for more. We are honored to recognize Beth Barber as the Employee of the Month for February for many reasons. One reason stands out above all. Beth's class has been quarantined three times so far this year. At the time of this nomination, it had only been twice. As challenging as distance learning can be, Beth has maintained a great attitude through all quarantines and during our closure. She has gone above and beyond for each of her students while on distance learning. She differentiates instruction, adapts lessons for unique home situations, and even safely brings materials to students' homes. Bev talks to her students on the phone, sends them cards, and connects with families in a special way. We are incredibly proud of her for her innovation and willingness to learn new technology in the midst of a global crisis. Bev is a leader in our building and well-respected among her peers. She shares resources and is a mentor to others. It is known that Bev expects high achievement from her students. It is just a part of who she is. She walks the walk by continuing to stay in the know of current research and practices. She's a lifelong learner and teacher. Congratulations, Ms. Bev Parker. Congratulations. And for those that aren't from Fox City, I'll go a little further and embarrass her a little bit. Beverly was part of the Barker family that 30, 40 years ago put Ponca City tennis on the map. She's probably a <laughs> three-time state champion, had sisters yep. that were state champion, had a brother that was a year or two younger than me, had a sister older than me, part of the, the Barber family that was just a tradition in Ponca City tennis. She, she tells a story about playing Chris Everett. Uh, I don't I doubt don't, that. Yeah. She was good. She was really good. And, and you know she's not a digital native uh, if she's been in this business that long. So being in quarantine three times, you know, she has embraced the distance learning, and it's harder for people that are digital natives. Oh, okay, next will be the Support Employee of the Month, Maureen Dewey, Secretary at Registration Center. Maureen has truly gone above and beyond this year. With PCVA being stationed at the Registration Center, she has definitely had more added to her plate. She is always willing to step in and help wherever needed. She assists families with registration, helps Ponca City Virtual Academy families and teachers, and has even been seen helping some of the custodial duties when needed. She has been such a huge asset to the PCBA family We could not have functioned this year without having her help. She has taken on these duties with a smile on her face. She is so deserving of being employed in that. Congratulations, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. And the last one will be the friend of education, the K County Health Department. And trust me, these people have just done a main up job to help us out. There's, there's not enough really thank yous we can say for the health department on the COVID vaccinations. Yes, we have. Uh, we're on daily daily communication with them. So, City Public Schools would like to recognize the K County Health Department as the friend of education. The Cape County Health Department has been a valuable resource for our school as we entered into these uncharted waters. Amy Weehunt and her team at Cape County Health Department have provided the district with resources <coughs> for our mitigation efforts, communication protocols for 14 students and staff, and more importantly, are only a phone call away when we have questions. The partnership that has been forged between the Cape County Health Department and Hawk City Schools has been a benefit to both our students and our community Ponca City is proud to recognize Cape County Health Department as our friend of education. Thank you again to the Cape County Health Department. Next on the agenda is the superintendent's report, both legislating and COVID-19 updates. Okay, I'm going to be pretty brief. Um, 
this morning was a busy morning. We did have our first legislative update and talked about some of the bills that educators are watching in Oklahoma. And we had our OASA executive committee. So uh, I actually have updated this even since those meetings. So we are in the first regular session of the 58th legislature. And I want to give you just some key points from Governor Stitt's address on 201. Uh, he, as you know, is committed to having all students back to in-person learning. He mentioned in his State of the State address that he wanted to prioritize educator vaccines to phase two. And he said that most educators 65 and plus have been vaccinated with dose one and anticipates the remainder to receive dose one this month. I will say that all of our 65 and plus educators who want to be vaccinated are done. Some are even going back for their second round. Uh, at this point, I do not see all educators being vaccinated by um, the end of February, according to the OSDH basis. So play that by ear and see what happens. He also suggested re-imaging the state aid formula. He is proposing changing from a three-year look back or a three-year high on enrollment to the number of current students. And this morning we learned that he is suggesting our July money comes from the previous year, that we don't get to go back to the second year look back. Uh, he indicated there were 55,000 ghost students costing taxpayers $200 million. He provided many instances of tolls taken on families and students because students in some districts do not have the person, the, the option for in-person learning. Uh, he indicated that parents needed to have the option to transfer to public schools that best fits their needs. And, there are a lot of key bills in regarding the transfers, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. He also proposed holding flat the budget for common education and funding the flex flexible benefits allowances, which are our insurance funds, which we're, we're thankful for that. Uh, he said the public school or schools are the heart of the community, and, and we, do believe, we do agree with him on that. So here's some bills to watch. This one could affect us momentarily. Uh, Senate Bill 1031 is in regard to the Open Meeting Act being able to have, permit virtual meetings. Uh, that expired in December, and I believe it was November 15th actually is when it expired. And it takes legislation to extend that. It has already made it through the Senate and it went to the House on Monday with no amendments and it's currently on the governor's desk and he has not signed it as of this 10 seconds. So that would allow us to move back to virtual meetings which during these times of COVID would certainly help us out a lot. Let's talk about open transfers and the governor and many of our legislators in, are pushing um, bills to be filed to require open transfers across school districts. So um, that could be an issue. Here's some key points. Open transfers should allow the receiving district the option of not accepting the transfer. They're saying if there is room in the school that the student should be able to go there. Um, right now, districts can deny receiving students depending upon the circumstances you know we take a look at that take a look at our class size uh, take a look at lots of things open transfers available at any time hinder the ability for our districts to plan uh, we don't know how many students we may have uh, districts need estimated student numbers we need that to determine our staffing and to maintain our appropriate class size that best fits a student's needs. And we, we need that to identify what innovative programs that allow students opportunities that can be maintained or eliminated. So um, we, we need to know our students and we need those cutoffs and we need those deadlines. Uh, 
This is a big thing through COSA and OSSBA is pushing local control back to the open transfers for the districts. Here's another big thing. Local property owners approve our bond issues to build schools for growth within the district. Uh, classroom space could be eliminated or be taken up with transfers. Local residents would have paid or will pay in the future for facilities or other for other districts students at valorum if, if we if we have to take all the transfers we're not receiving the ad valorum um, tax money for those students that come in so could be lots of issues but but this all stems back i believe to pandemic related issues some schools are in person some schools are total remote some schools are a b and while it may be good for kids or a family's needs, it could certainly devastate districts and harm us on our planning and futures. Back, three, back to that one, okay. did, does the bill address athletics? No, but it would play into that. You know that would happen. That's one of our big concerns. <laughs> and kind of OS, OSSAA is adamantly opposed because yeah. of the year's eligibility loss. So. Um, yeah, it would play into it. It could be if this were approved or if this were legislation that athletes could just go to whatever program, depending on if not their parents could get them there. Um, three year high state funding formula. This is a big thing for us that, that we do believe that the state funding formula needs to be tweaked. It's 30 years old. It's probably one of the most equitable funding formulas in the nation. Um, but there's some key points. It's not the time to make significant changes to the formula when we're literally fighting a global pandemic. And the reason is enrollment is in a constant flux. Uh, our enrollment's down this year, two to 300 just because people didn't want to go to in-person school and they wanted to go to virtual charters. And I will tell you that our enrollment is up since December or since second semester. We got a lot of our students back from virtual charter schools and um, we just really don't want to, the, the formula to change when we don't, we want to see how things level out when the pandemic is over. Um, it allows for us to plan, to determine teaching staff numbers, to plan for class size, to identify programs that we need to add or may eliminate based on our calculations. So if you remember, um, we worked hard for the last couple of years to take 1.9 million out of the budget because we knew from the second year previous look back that we were gonna have a shortfall. And that's something you just can't eliminate overnight. Uh, having the two-year look back from the three-year high gives us some uh, transitional time to get that done. It just can't be done immediately. And we've been successful with that because we've had that time. And we study those numbers and we plan and meet accordingly. So we are certainly not in favor of that. Um, now. Even though Oklahoma's current state aid formula allows schools to benefit from prior student counts for planning purposes, at the same time, those numbers are included in our chargeables. So our motor vehicle gross production, our school land, our county four, four mill formula. So even though we're able to plan with previous numbers, still a chargeable and reduces our, our state aid. So. That's something we're keeping our eye on. Some important legislative dates to know. Uh, legislature convened, convened on February 1 at noon. March 11th is the last day for the bill to be heard in Chamber of Origin. The 22nd of April is the last day for the bill to be heard in opposite chamber. And then May 28th is the last day of session. And and the two meetings that I had this morning, we know that we have got a lot of work to do. So we're going to be really diligent and meet with our legislators and meet with our community to 
discuss with our community some of these issues and to discuss our legislatures. We believe that public schools are the heart of the community and the governor does too. So we, we want to keep our uh, public schools in communities stable and in person. So advocacy opportunities, COSA, OSSBA, USSAA, legislative briefings began today. We had our first one today, very informative. There will be BOE and teacher advocacy dates established, and usually uh, Zach and I talk about some dates that our teachers can go down and lobby at the Capitol. I don't know if people did. No, that's so true. I know OBA is organizing like small group Zooms with legislators and doing virtual chats. And, and obviously, we will allow our teachers to do that and we schedule some time, and then I, I have a good relationship with both Senator Coleman and Representative Latrell. I talk to them regularly. Um, I also have an open line with Ty, Ty Burns. He'll call me on a lot of questions. He is not from our district in our area. He doesn't represent Ponca City, but he was a former Ponca City Public Schools teacher. So I, I hear from him regularly during the session. Um, and I'm going to provide a legislative update with brief topics each board meeting. So anybody have questions, concerns, comments on our topics to watch for legislation this year? Go back and define STITS 55,000 ghost students. I can't define it. He, he, he's, he's saying that we're being paid for students that are in our district, which are these technically Pardon me? Are these epic? No, no. And I think he's using the term ghost students because that's what was used with epic. If we use a two-year two look back period, some of those students aren't in our district. But he's calling those ghost students. Now, it evens out because we're, we're, it goes against our chargeable and then someone else has those kids. So the formula is well founded. It's been successful for 30 years, so it, it would be a hardship on public schools to plan. So, any other questions, concern? I'm going to give you a quick COVID update. Uh, I hate to get too reliable on this uh, risk alert, but this is our COVID alert system update, and I kind of made a different chart. You can see where we started out. It's it actually has a green level. We've never been there. Green, yellow, orange one, orange two, red. Uh, we took a big tumble last week from over 100 for four to five previous weeks to 49.2. And we knew that was going to happen because we had been watching the new cases in Cape County every day, uh, praying it's not a flu. So one thing about it, when it's cold and icy, people aren't getting out testing. And if you recall, back at the end of October, when we had the ice storm, two weeks later, we went into the red. And um, people were gathering at that time. Of course, we lost power. Hopefully, people are being vigilant and mitigating during this ice storm or these, this inclement weather. See how that works last week? Our numbers were better, and I won't read that to you, but we were down 100 people affected, over 100 people affected from the previous week. And here's what I can say about that COVID alert system. We feel it no matter what it is. If it's high, we're high in, within our in-school close contacts and isolations. If it's lower, we're lower. I will tell you, our day is going to be low this week because we haven't been in school. So we have a few family close contacts and a few family uh, positives out there, but it's going to go down this week. And, and then we'll see what happens. But based on previous data, it's going to go right back up. But there is hope. It looks like cases are down in Oklahoma. Hospitalizations are down. Um, but at the same time, I read just the other night that the death rate is up. So uh, hopefully, if we get these vaccines pushed out, that will make a difference. But all kinds of variables there. 
Here's our current site data. I corrected this at 8.30 last night. Uh, it actually looks really, really good. Um, last week we had tons of staff returning. Our staff numbers were way down. And if you look at the green columns, these are quarantines that are pending, not identified. At our last board meeting, I had some major concerns because we had anywhere from 10 to 12 in each column that were pending. We have zero pending right now. Uh, two weeks ago, we really worried about West Middle School. We got to about 30% of our students out. And of course, with us doing our own contact tracing, and Chris and I discuss this every day, if there is a connection between the students. There didn't appear to be a connection, and they held their own for the following two days. Then kids were returning due to the shorter quarantine, the 10 day quarantine. So we just didn't feel the need to move to, we just held tight and watched our data rather than moving to distance learning. We had the same thing with East last week. East got the highest it's ever been, but um, we haven't been back to school, but they had a lot of school, a lot of kids returning on Monday and Tuesday, and that data is reflected there. So that's good news. Now here's something that the public doesn't see. These are our site percentages affected. And if you look at our staff at all the sites, I won't read the names of our sites, but look at all the sites have, that have zero staff affected. Occasionally we have one or two that have zero percent of their staff affected. Our highest right now is Roosevelt with 12.9. That's four people. Um, not necessarily teachers, not necessarily positives, could be support, could be an isolation or a quarantine. On the student side, our highest rate is still east, even with tons of students returning Monday and Tuesday. Today's Wednesday. I don't know, had you closed out anymore because I prepared this last night? We did, it was very small. Okay. Um, so it's probably hovering around 12, 13% at East. Wildcat Academy is really low. Liberty is really low as far as, as far as students out. Union has two classes out right now, and they've been pretty lucky. One is a self-contained class, and then another one is a, a grade level classroom that's out. So there's where we are as far as our numbers. And neither one are slated to come back tomorrow, are they? Okay, come back on Monday, both the union classes. Washington, we had three classes out at once. Uh, right now we just have one. Was that supposed to come back today? The class that was out come back today, Curtis? Because I didn't have an update. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. So that those numbers will change too. I would think that the new CDC guidelines will artificially lower these numbers a little bit. Maybe. The 14 down to 10 or the new quarantines after a positive or a negative after seven days. Right. So they should impact that a little bit. Well, we're side. getting to the point, too, that we have had enough, and we track this on our running record, we have had enough that have tested positive that they're exempt from close contact quarantine for 90 days. And, and that's a, that's, that number's growing quite a bit. We're already, the 90 days is already up until April. Oh, I think I did some this morning that they're, they're exempt from quarantine, like even early in May. Um, we also have some positives who tested so so early in the school year that their their exemption has passed their 90 days has passed so um, I will tell you that we have seen our second employee who's developed COVID twice within the 90 days unrelated not connected and um, with the 10-day quarantine that will help us hold tight and keep our buildings open because we will we will connect the dots to see if any positives are connected and then we can also see when students are returning. Now at the elementary sites we automatically transition the entire classroom to distance learning. We're at a point with some of our elementary te teachers that 
they're within that 90 days of testing positive, so they'll be in class, in their classroom, but the students will be up. And in fact, we've had some students that we've put in other classrooms because they've been exempt, um, so they could come to school. So it's an interesting dynamic in constant bookkeeping. So here's our district-wide trend data for first semester, and I've shared that with you each board meeting. Um, the lowest week was that week in October when we had the ice storm. Of course, we weren't in school. I can imagine this week's going to be a low, a low trend rate too. Then the week of the 13th was our highest week, and at that point is when the board determined the week after that to go to distance learning for the remainder of the semester. And you, it was actually the week of the 20th um, that that was determined. And you can see we just dropped. I highlighted in pink the weeks that we were on distance learning before the break, and, and those fell just like you would expect them to. Uh, here's your second semester so far. Um, the first week back, obviously, we had the fewest close contacts. <laughs> After the first week, of course, it amped up, but it went down, went back up, went down, and then I, I believe this week will be particularly low, so our turn data. Now, there is some new guidance on our close quarantines after complete vaccination. We got that maybe just Monday. Uh, no, it had to be Friday because I originally worked on this over the weekend. And we've had some parents question us, once their children get fully vaccinated, will they be exempt from post-contact quarantines? We haven't, we had an answer because we didn't have any guidance. Here, here's the reality. Students 16 to 18, it's going to be a long way before their phase comes up. But this is going to start affecting some of our teachers, some of our 65-year-old teachers who have already had their second vaccine. So individuals more than 10 days after COVID-19 vaccine completion will not be required to quarantine after an exposure to COVID-19. So I'm not sure any of our 65 and older are 10 days out. We might be getting close, but teachers won't have to quarantine once they get that second phase of vaccination. So on day 11, that's when the individual exceptions begin. So if, if, if they've had both vaccines, both the vaccine, the first dose and the booster dose, and they become a close contact and 10 full days have not passed, regular quarantine rules apply. Uh, and then regardless of prior infection, if anyone is exhibiting symptoms, we are going to isolate or quarantine. So until we get a, a evaluation from a COVID-19 test. So that's going to help us with our teachers a lot sooner than our students. And if this continues on uh, up until to next year, and we fully anticipate it to continue on at least maybe up into the fall, that will help us with students with this maybe. And, and right now it's just 16 to, eight, 16 to 18 year old students. So it will help us with our younger students. Any questions, comments, or discussions on our COVID update and where we are on that? There's a lot of things working in our favor, so. Curtis, you have anything? Sure. All right. Okay. So there we go. Next is the consent agenda, which included the, this agenda, the minutes from last meeting, and the contracts under 10,000, there were just four of them. And they were insignificant, non controversial. So I would look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So move. Oh, I have a motion second. from Don, a second from Judy. There's no one else is here. Call for the vote. Mr. Nizer? Aye. Mrs. Troop? Aye. Mr. Riley? Aye. Action items. Motion required to consider take action on the following district financial report. These are the standard reports. 
that we talked about in all the finance meetings, and it also includes the ratification and approval of payrolls, which is a very big thing to a lot of people. So I look for a motion to approve item 5A through M. I'll make a motion. I have a motion from Judy and a second from Don. Yes. I've got that figured out. Call for the vote. This is true. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mr. Newsom. Motion carries. Number two, the board to consider take action on the resolution determining the maturities of its setting dates, time and place for the sale of $6.9 million in general obligation building bonds for the school district. This is, Brenda, and this is the last payment on the lease revenue? Yes. Yes, this is the last time on this, the last time. From the bond issue of the lease revenue we did. Uh, it looks like Stephen McDonald wants to have a meeting on the 14th of April at 11.30 to uh, sell the bonds. Comments or questions about this? No, just check the calendar. I forgot to look and see. I've seen the 14th minute. Uh, Are you looking?
Don and I hadn't seen this one. And Mr. Riley, you might have heard us talk about why we didn't have a committee. You know, typically we have a committee, a calendar committee. So Curtis, we used to be member of our ACT team, and really we kind of, in the last three or four years, have got some boxes that have to be checked off. And, you know, from our administrative end, and the teacher end, and from the community end, and this one kind of checked off all the boxes. Uh, so that was kind of a, really good that everybody felt like they met most of our needs. Uh, we don't like to start on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we like, always like to have more weekends than Christmas. Uh, one of the outlaw more religious things like that and then um, thirdly we look since everybody kind of agreed that kind of met all of our all the requirements we've had in the past five or six years uh, didn't really want to have a reason for people to get uh, didn't feel like it'd be very effective meeting over zoom uh, haven't found that as a very good discussion format it's pretty good for one-way communication and um, you know, we kind of reached out, we kind of reached out to administrators and teachers, and uh, Zach sent out um, some kind of feelers for any other variation that you wanted to look at. And really just kind of came to a consensus that this one really fits the district and what we're trying to get done. So, um, so with that being a pandemic, we feel really the need to have this huge district wide committee meeting, certainly not in person, and really by the same I thought. And our, our association agreed with that. It's in yeah. our bargaining unit. And our parents were okay with Did that. Did I miss it in the stuff you guys sent us? Because I couldn't find it in my, on my computer. The calendar. Is it on? Is it in there somewhere? I just couldn't find it. The calendar itself. No, it should have been in your packet. No, I just didn't see it. I, I didn't find it. Maybe it's just me. Just don't look at it. Well, we're looking at that. Let's talk about the two snow days. If we would anticipate send hot spots, Chromebooks home, would we really need two snow days? Or would we in essence make school out two days early if we didn't use them? If we convert it with distance learning. This week's a real good example of that. Sometimes that snow day gets hits like that, we don't have devices out. So but normal snow days, you have a pretty good indication. So why are we bringing them back in and taking them back? In case you do have these yeah. kind of deals, why don't we just let them keep them? That's kind of where I was going. We're changing that. that process. I mean, it doesn't make sense. We give them something, we take it back every other day or whatever. I mean, Barbara. Why? For our secondary, they do keep theirs, but our elementary, we don't have cases for those devices. And so, you know, we have 2,000 some odd devices that we're sending out with no cases, and we don't have that many backups if they can have the broken screens. That's how big. You're talking about the computers, you're talking about the hotspots. The Chromebooks. I'm talking about hotspots. Hotspots, we're changing that process. They're going home with the families. Exactly, you want to still need the device. Yeah, they have a device, so. But don't we have a $25 insurance policy? Yeah, because we have to spend on cases and stuff, and we didn't get any cases for them? Well. It doesn't make sense. That was a decision in, in property committee that we decided against that, so. And I thought we used the, I thought we were going to use $25 per instrument insurance fee. Yeah, we did, but we just didn't purchase cases. The board decided not to do that. Right, but we were going to use the so you're the one decided that. I'm right. going to say it again. You're the one that decided Well, I didn't want to buy cases. cases. I, got I didn't want to buy cases because we were going to use the insurance money for the broken ones. But they just didn't. But, they didn't, but, they didn't, but they didn't send them home. They didn't send them home. So I think them. we do need to take a look at sending them home and maybe we need to buy cases well for them. i'm going to recommend that i'm going to make that as a recommendation with our sr2 funds but the last two days if the kids would have had them in advance we wouldn't have had them. yeah we wouldn't have two days school right they, yeah it could have been out of school two days early right i mean that, that's where you're coming from i think yeah that's it it's the same thing on these two because you never know what's going to happen it could even be in the middle of the summer 
springtime, we got tornadoes and stuff. They can stay. Tornadoes. Whatever. Fine. You name got, it. It could we be. We've got power and got internet. They should be able to go to school. If snow yes. days work well, but the way that, if you look at the way the calendar ends, snow days work kind of really well in there uh, because. But also, graduation is the same day as the last day of school on the calendar, too. I'm sorry, what time? Graduation is the same day as the last day of school, the way the calendar is written, which may be okay. I, I'm just saying that. And, and that time. hasn't been established. That's typically, though, the last day of school, the Friday of the last day of school is when graduation is established. It's not on the calendar. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, but that, that's, well, it's on a Friday, so that's when it really has to be. Friday being the last day of school. But that, it's a, Judy and Nancy and their committee were okay with I mean, I'm okay with it. I'm like, Don, I, I think we need to take a hard look at, do we want to send Chromebooks, Hotspots home in advance? Because we've got a pretty big chunk of government money coming in. To help that, that's items. going to be the recommendation, and if that pleases the board, to take those measures uh, yeah. it's Oklahoma we can't predict the weather or, or we would have sent them home on Friday okay we still got to go no. weather it will be sending them home and, and at least until we get out of danger for inclement weather and then well, we move we'll on be to when does our contract expire for hot spots uh, end of the school year so do we anticipate having to buy a spade next year? Uh, we will have to make sure that every family has one and, and we'll probably, uh, we can talk about some ideas that we're discussing for next year. Should we have to go on distance learning? Um, I would hope not next year, but I can't point. predict the pandemic here. I mean, it could be a new point. I, I think we need to purchase one per family. Chromebook or hotspot? Hotspot. Everybody needs a Chromebook, which we have that. We just yeah, don't send them home with hand. our elementary. Yeah, we're good on that. We were fine with the secondary. Um, I can tell you some problems that we'll run into by sending the hotspot home and leave it home. But at this point, it is a bookkeeping. It's not efficient bookkeeping. At this point, here we are, nearly March. Hopefully we won't have distance learning or as many quarantines. I'm of the opinion, and Barbara and I talked last night, that we send the, the hotspot home with the oldest child in the family at this point. Should we be, not be negotiating with the carriers right now for better deals on hotspots because they kind of took advantage of us, one of the carriers did. Uh, AT&T and t was a little bit higher and in, in we would have probably gone with all T-Mobile, but one part of town, T-Mobile works, and one part of town, AT&T works. And we're finding ourselves swapping out with our kids if the AT&T or the T-Mobile don't work in the area that they live. But you hate to buy 400 hot spots if we don't even think we're going to need any, if we don't know them. Who knows? Yeah. And, but then where would we be if we couldn't get them? <clears throat> Luckily, everything that we're replacing now is t-mobile and our t-mobile rep it, i mean he works with us we we can get in a need for hot spots and he will get them to us ryan maybe two to three days i mean literally here in our hands so he's been real uh, efficient and we're hanging on to the at&t that we have because you're right they are a lot more expensive so i'm like Okay, we have a motion from Don to approve the school calendar. Second, I send from Judy. Yes. Call for the vote. Mr. Riley. Aye. This is true. Aye. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Motion carries. Number four, consider and take action on declaring March 2nd as Read Across America Day. Can we talk about that, Shelly? Uh, this is celebrated in conjunction with Dr. Seuss's birthday, and it's an opportunity that we can get. Uh, different readers via Zoom this year to read to our students and um, share the love of reading. Our teachers go all out on that. And typically we do have guest speakers, but we, we're going to have to have, we can record reading of books this year and share them across the district. So the question becomes, how old is Dr. Seuss today? Or on March 2nd? 
I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Google that, somebody. Anybody know? I guess nobody knows. They're Googling it. Zach's up there Googling it. Okay. Well, did, you, did you have any in your school? I read it to my kid. I don't remember whether I read it to Dr. Seuss or not. Okay. So I would accept a motion to declare March 2nd as Free Across America Day. I'll make a motion. Second. Motion from Judy. Second from Dawn. All through the vote. Mr. Nasser. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. This is true. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Number five is consider take action on changes to activity fund custodians and bonding authorization. We've had a couple of retirements, so we need to make a couple of changes. We need Jeff to become the uh, child nutrition nutrition director and Leanne Allen, the district activities clerk, to replace Carl Webb. Make motion to approve. Have a motion from Don, second from Judy. Call for the vote. Mr. Riley. Aye. This is true. Aye. Mr. Newsom. Aye. Motion carries. Number six, consider to take action on agreement with Bob Hurley, Dodge, Chrysler Jeep. Chrysler Jeep. What's the R? Not Ram. 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 To purchase a cargo van for maintenance department. Any comments or questions about that? No, I'll make a motion to approve. Have a motion from Don and a second from Judy. Call for the vote. Mr. Nason. Aye. This is true. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Motion carries number seven. We don't need an executive session, do we? We do not, for once. Less daughter Judy, do you want anyone? Yeah, I'd like to have a moment just her. Okay. If we could, real quick, that's five minutes. Okay. We have a motion to convene to executive session for the following purpose to discuss the possible termination, reassignments, resignations, and employment of personnel on the attached detailed personnel report, to discuss the purchase of or appraisal of real property and to discuss confidential conversations with the board's attorney concerning pending claims and litigation. Make a motion. Got a motion from Don, second from Judy. Judy. Call for the vote. Mr. Riley. Aye. This is true. Aye. Mr. Lisa. Aye. We are now in executive session. That's right. Okay, we're officially back into session. Uh, recital by the board president that minutes of executive session were kept by the board minutes clerk and will remain confidential. Number 10, consider and take action recommendation for termination, reassignment, resignation, and employment of the personnel. Do I have a motion to approve number 10? Mm -hmm. Motion from Don, Seven. second from Judy. Call for the vote, Jane. Mr. Riley. Aye. This is true. Aye. Mr. Nixon. Aye. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. And a second, yes. Yes. Call for the vote. Everybody. All right. All right. We're adjourned.